Maryland Heights had long overlooked the town of Harper's Ferry, which was once called one of the most stupendous scenes in nature by Thomas Jefferson as he traveled to Philadelphia in 1783. The town's namesake, the ambitious Robert Harper, had ensured that it became an important hub of travel and industry since its founding in 1761. During the Civil War, the Maryland Heights were quickly fortified with various artillery emplacements, though in 1862 these defenses were put to little use by the sparse defenders sent by Colonel Dixon Miles, who commanded the Union garrison. After five hours of holding off two Confederate brigades, with the mortal wounding of Colonel Eliakim Sherrill of the 126th New York, there was little holding the Green regiments together to defend the Heights. The Union troops would end up retreating to the town, leaving the Heights entirely to the Confederates. With the taking of the Maryland Heights, the next task for the rebels was for four Parrot guns to be brought up, each of which weighed almost 1,800 pounds and took 200 men each to lug them up the steep slopes of the mountain. The naval guns that had been set up earlier in the year along the heights, including the massive 50-pound Parrot and two 9-inch Dahlgrens, had all been spiked by the Union artillerymen when they saw the infantry retreating. General McClaws was then forced to focus his attention on General Franklin's 6th Corps bearing down on the troops he had defending Crampton's Gap, leaving only a single regiment to hold the heights. They had much to thank from Colonel Miles' reticence that the Union garrison didn't attempt a breakout towards them especially as the booms of cannon fire could be heard coming from the nearby South Mountain Passes on the 14th. The Shenandoah and Potomac Rivers had for millions of years converged and cut through the tough quartzite and softer rocks of several Appalachian ridgelines on their quest to the sea. These waters were an important factor to local commerce and industry, as the waters were used to feed canals for both boating and for water power in the many factories along their banks. With the burning of the pre-Civil War bridges by the Confederates in 1861, Union engineers had erected a pontoon bridge in early 1862 across the Potomac River at the base of the Maryland Heights to ferry wagons and horses safely. On the 14th, the pontoons were used by the intrepid Captain Benjamin Davis and 1,200 troopers of various cavalry units to cross in the middle of the night and escape the siege, and to get word to General McClellan of the town's plight. While Davis and his cavalry detachment managed to capture Longstreet's artillery ammunition wagons on their way to find the Army of the Potomac, the next morning left the town in an even tighter grip by Confederate forces. General McClaws had finished clearing enough of the mountain for his cannons to operate and set up a better road for his troops and guns, while General Walker had arrived on Loudoun Heights south of the Shenandoah with his guns. Finally, General Jackson, in overall charge of the siege, had arrived down the Shepherdstown Road from the north and positioned his forces on Schoolhouse Ridge, completing the encirclement. Even the Union officers fully realized that with the giving up of the Maryland and Loudoun Heights, defeat was a mere inevitability. The downtown section of Harper's Ferry included many of the important businesses at The Point, where the peninsula ends. The area also featured the most prominent industry of the town since its purchase by the U.S. government under President Washington in 1796. The Harper's Ferry Armory, which was second only to the Springfield Armory in Massachusetts. The Baltimore and Ohio Railroad also crossed the Potomac at Harper's Ferry, with the first bridge having been completed in 1836. Over the course of the Civil War, however, 
many businesses would be obliterated by the conflict, not to mention the destruction of both the B&O Bridge and the Shenandoah Bridge that had been used by lumbermen to supply fuel for the armory. Of prominent interest was the infamous John Brown's Fort, which had been the armory's firehouse prior to the fateful night in October of 1859 that led to then Brevet Colonel Robert E. Lee being tasked by President Buchanan with quelling Brown's nascent uprising. Following Brown's refusal to surrender, it only took three minutes for Lee and his contingent of local soldiers and Marines to storm the firehouse and capture Brown and his surviving insurrectionists. Prior to the siege, many Union and Confederate soldiers carved out bricks from the structure as souvenirs though before the siege it had been repaired and used as a storehouse and quartermaster building. It was also the only building to survive the two burnings of the armory. Schoolhouse Ridge was the third furrow of elevation that occurred to the west of the Harpers Ferry Peninsula, and it was there that Stonewall Jackson arranged his three divisions of Jones, Lawton, and A.P. Hill. The Confederate forces were very surprised by the lack of challenge from Colonel Miles and the garrison, who had perhaps taken General McClellan's instructions to hold the town at all costs too much to heart. On the evening of the 14th, several regiments from Jones's brigade attempted a night assault to distract the Federals from the flanking movement of A.P. Hill's brigades across the Shepherdstown Road and to the south of the Charleston Pike. They quickly scattered the few skirmishers arrayed below the entrenchments at Bolivar Heights, but were not able to get past the prominent ridge line. As A.P. Hill's light division got into position, the officers of the Union garrison were worriedly considering their situation in one of several councils of war. Colonel Miles doggedly refused his fellow officers' suggestions to leave the town or for an attempt to retake the Maryland Heights, possibly due to a stubborn and literal interpretation of his orders, and possibly due to several allegations of being drunk during the siege. In either case, unbeknownst to the Federals, both sides were roughly equal in strength, as over 50 guns from Schoolhouse Ridge, Loudoun Heights and Maryland Heights ranged against the Union defenses, and as the morning of the 15th dawned, a terrible bombardment was set to weaken their resolve. High Street was one of the main roads leading from the downtown area up to Camp Hill and the town of Bolivar, transitioning into Washington Street after passing Clay Street. Many residences and shops were found along this street for the townsfolk, and the road also passes by the beginning of the famous stone staircase, which had been hand-carved out of the shale by parishioners of both the St. John and St. Paul churches in the 1820s. The staircase had been expanded to reach the equally famous Jefferson Rock, which overlooks the beautiful River Valley, and was the spot from which Thomas Jefferson and his daughter gazed at the natural beauty of the area in 1783. The staircase also passes the location of Robert Harper's own residence, which was completed in 1782, though he never had the chance to live there himself. The beginning of High Street was opposite Arsenal Square, a collection of warehouses where many of the finished products from the armory were stored and closely guarded from folks such as John Brown, who would intend to use the stock for their ill-intended pursuits. The Arsenal stores were also used by more illustrious passers-by, such as Meriwether Lewis in 1803, just a year after the manufactory officially opened. 
he was able to acquire a number of guns, equipment, and trade items from the 25 armorers then working at the factory, as well as help with the creation of his collapsible iron-framed canoe he had designed for the trip west. While the other items worked perfectly, Lewis was mortified when his collapsible canoe wasn't able to stay afloat two years later. The town of Bolivar, to the east of Harper's Ferry, was heavily surrounded by open space, which was then capitalized on by the Union Army for the many tents needed to house all of the garrisoning troops, as well as the trenches and embankments necessary to defend the upper section of the peninsula. An enterprising crew of artillery set up on the Bolivar Heights could have an almost unobstructed means of bombarding the lower town, and so its retention would be vital to trying to keep the area. As such, the garrison was an easy distance of the defensive works when General Jackson arrived from the direction of Shepherdstown to the north. The mostly New Yorker regiments, of which all were brand new regiments that hadn't even seen battle it was before, early in the morning were tasked with shells holding the, the Confederate artillery trenches against began the to oncoming rain down on the defenders on Bolivar Heights and in the towns of Bolivar and Harper's Ferry. General Jackson had gone so far as to say to General McClaws that he should let the work be done thoroughly and to demolish the place. Lieutenant James Clark of the 115th New York, who were placed in the middle of the line defending Bolivar Heights, said of the bombardment that, at first their missiles of death fell far short of our camp, but each succeeding shell came nearer and nearer, until the earth was plowed up at our feet and our tents torn to tatters. The troops dived for cover in what valleys and leeways they could find, but A.P. Hill's Walker's battery coming into position ended that last refuge as well. Shenandoah Street went along the south side of the Harpers Ferry Peninsula, following its namesake river. To the north of the road above the cliff faces were two of the town's most prominent churches, including the St. Peter's Roman Catholic Church and St. John's Episcopal Church, which were both overtaken as hospitals or barracks for the soldiers. To the south, the road abuts the upper and lower Hall Islands and Virginius Island, which in the lead up to the Civil War were heavily industrialized with various factories, worker housing, and mills. When the Confederates were retreating from the town in 1861, these businesses were put to the flame once they had been fully looted, just like the U.S. Armory and the two bridges into town. Another factor which made Harper's Ferry such a strategic town was the B&O Railroad, the oldest railroad in the United States and a crucial supply route for the Union forces all the way to Chicago and the proverbial breadbasket of the North. Colonel Miles had been in charge of protecting this important rail line prior to the Confederate invasion, where he and his troops were diverted to protecting the town. Despite the burning of the original bridge across the Potomac in 1861, it took engineers from the b &O Company barely three weeks to rebuild a metal truss frame structure on the original foundations, which was guarded by two guns from Potts's battery and the 1st Maryland Potomac Home Brigade during the siege.
When Robert Harper passed away in 1782, he was laid to rest on the hill overlooking the town he had spent the last few decades developing. And by 1803, the area around his burial plot was officially demarcated as the town cemetery at the demand of Robert's son, William. John Hall, who would become the U.S. Armory's first superintendent, would occupy the property just west of the cemetery, and with the government's help, made additions and improvements to the original cottage and outbuildings. In 1848, Superintendent John Symington redesigned the road and armory housing layout for Camp Hill, including the demolition of the Hall Cottage to make way for the new paymaster's quarters. With the burning of the armory itself, Many of the government buildings on Camp Hill were overtaken as officers' quarters for the local garrison, alongside the tent city which had sprung up on the hillsides. Like many graveyards of the 19th century, the Harper Graveyard remained a peaceful and quiet getaway from the bustle of town and its several industries for the local citizens. Many of the most prominent townsfolk and veterans of many wars were buried and remembered there, including several veterans from the Revolutionary War through to the Mexican-American War. General Miles might have used that quietude as he considered the troops put in his care to defend against half of the Confederate Army, saying of their quality that many had never had a gun in their hand until the boxes were opened and the muskets issued to them yesterday. That, in part, was perhaps a large factor in his decisions to come. Bolivar Heights was a major ridgeline which helped separate the peninsula from the mainland of Virginia, and was also a major defensive impediment to the rebel army trying to take the town. It saw early action in the war from a small skirmish that occurred on the two-year anniversary of the John Brown raid, and again was threatened by General Jackson during the Valley Campaign in May of 1862. He nearly was able to capture the town were it not for the staunch defense of General Rufus Saxton in hastily set up embankments. These paltry defenses were once again used and added to by Colonel Miles several months later, particularly with the creation of an artillery redoubt on the southern end of the heights that overlooked the Chambers Farm and Charlestown Pike. Unfortunately for Colonel Miles, he did not share the success of his predecessor in defending the town when Jackson returned. The 32nd Ohio, 9th Vermont, and 125th New York were all that could be brought to bear to counter the threat of A.P. Hill's Light Division, which was then marching up to flank from the south. Even with the help of the 87th Ohio already guarding the railroad, there were little match for the entire division they were facing, and were instead pushed back up the slope in a fighting retreat. It was only thanks to the call for surrender that they were able to avoid total annihilation. After Colonel Miles and his fellow officers in blue considered their position, it was unanimously decided that they should surrender. Miles decided to ride to the Confederate lines with the white handkerchief to submit their terms. However, as he rode toward the rebel lines, a shell exploded near him and struck Miles in the leg, mortally wounding him. Despite the strong federal position on Bolivar Heights, with the almost uncontested surrounding of the peninsula, their fate had been sealed. General Jackson was able to ride into the town and its valuable stores of weapons, ammunition, uniforms, and food. Considering the general's dirty uniform, one Ohio private said to another that, he isn't much for looks, but if we'd had him, we wouldn't have been caught in this trap. As the Confederate forces for the second time took control of the town, Jackson received the urgent message from General Lee 
Jackson left to only return with Hill's all hands division to the army to finish the task of paroling the over 12,000 captured Union prisoners as his troops double quick to the north. Even though the siege had taken a full day more than originally planned, Jackson had done admirably well in taking the town with minimal losses on either side, besides the brief confrontation on the Maryland Heights. For the Union forces that had been captured, they only had a few weeks to wait in a non-active duty role before being able to redeem themselves and their regiments in future engagements. But Jackson's troops would soon see a more deadly elephant at Antietam in a few days' time. And their relatively easy victory along the idyllic banks of the Potomac and Shenandoah would soon be tempered by the full force of the Army of the Potomac, then heading towards General Lee and the rest of the Army of Northern Virginia.